I just want you to think real quick, what are the different hats you wear in your life? Like the roles you play. I mean, for me, I'm Jeff the student. I'm not the student anymore. I'm Jeff the post-student, I guess. Jeff the employee. Jeff the athlete. Jeff the speaker. Whatever. What's your method? What's yours? Just think for a second. All the different roles you have in your life. Now I want to ask you, which one of those, if taken from you, would you be devastated the most? Which one of your roles would you be undone? Could you not live if you didn't have it anymore? Now see, the, the real answer should be that you're a child of God. That one, if taken, should rock you to your core. But here's the funny thing. That's the only one that can't be taken from you. That's the only one. But yet we put our hope in the ones that can be taken from us. Right? And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. I'm going to read Ephesians 1, 3 through, 3 through 5. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons of Jesus Christ. Now see, that's where our identity should be. That says that we are child and children of the king. We are royalty if you have trusted Jesus. You're a prince, you're a princess, you're a king, you're a queen. Right? You have everything in Jesus. But it's funny that it usually doesn't go that way. Right? I, I don't trust in that. I trust in other things. Like the verse on the screen, Romans 1.25. We have exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and we worship and serve the created over the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. We put our identity in the created when our identity should be, identity should be in the creator. The one who died for us, the only one who's a rock. The created is not something you can stand on because it can be taken from you and it's flawed and broken because this is the only one that isn't. I mean, if you want to know the base fundamental issue with humanity, it's this. If you want to know why you have a lust problem, if you want to know why you have an alcohol problem, you want to know why you go from boyfriend to boyfriend, from girlfriend to girlfriend, it's because you don't know who you are. You don't know your identity. And I know in my life when I fall short all the time, and that's why too. Every sin issue is an identity issue. Because the truth is, who you really are, if you're a Christian, if you have trusted Jesus, who you really are has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with his performance, not yours. His effort, not yours. His victory, not yours. His death and resurrection, not yours. Right? I mean, um, there's a pastor named Martin Lloyd-Jones. He's one of my favorite. He was a pastor early 1900s. Um, he used to, when people would come for counseling, they would ask, he would ask one question. He would say, in the depths of your soul, do you know you're a Christian? Are you a Christian? He would ask them. And 95% of the time, they would say, well, I'm trying. And he goes, you've missed it. You don't get it. I mean, imagine if someone came up to me and said, Jeff, is your father Gary Bethke? Are you related to Gary Bethke? And I said, well, I'm trying. <laughs> it's not about activity. It's about identity. Identity is wrapped up in your father. You have nothing to do with it if you're a son or a daughter. It has everything to do with your father, the one that is above you, the king, Jesus, God. Right? <laughs> well, I'm trying. It is not, it's not the case. That's not the case. And so we're going to look at three issues, though, that we predominantly put our identity, and then we'll offer um, solutions to how Jesus is better and how the answers in that verse. All three answers to these are in the verse we just read. The first one is we put our identity in worldly pleasures and possessions. We demote ourselves from royalty to slaves and to animals. We say, I'm a slave to my desires. I have to do what my cravings tell me. I'm an animal. I'm subject to my instincts. I just, my identity, my worth, I'm defined by what feels good. I'm defined by how many boyfriends I can have. I'm defined by the new iPhone 4S. I'm defined by my new shoes. Right? And see, the, the, the problem with that, though, I mean, I fall into that daily. The problem with that, though, is it never works. When's the last time you've put your identity there and said, ah, I'm satisfied? I mean, have you? Because I know I have, and every time it just throws a curveball and it's not what I was expecting. And isn't that what happened in the garden? Adam and Eve ate the fruit, and they said, dang, that was it. Right? Because I think we need to realize that it doesn't satisfy. Human history is the miserable conveyor belt of people getting exactly what they crave and desire and going, is this it? Is this it? And they say, oh, that one must have been faulty or something. Let's just try the next one. I continue, I continue, I continue. 
I just use faulty, which Cameron loves that word, and I kind of use it in context for him, so sorry about that. Um, but that's true, right? It doesn't work. And, and since, we, since we think we're slaves, we starve. We starve. I mean, think about it. If you're a slave, like in old, old times or something, you don't eat well. You don't drink well. You're starved. You're malnourished, right? And so if you're a slave and you hadn't drank water in days, what do you think you would think if you saw a bowl of toilet water? What do you think you would do? In my opinion, I think it would be very appealing. I would run to that and I would drink from it if I had drink in days. If I, if I need something to quench my thirst, right? It might make me sick after, like worldly pleasures do, but I would run to it and it would satisfy. But see, when you're a child of the king, you have fresh, living water. Fresh, living water. And then what happens when you have that? Toilet water doesn't is attractive anymore, does it? And so it is with Jesus. When you have him, worldly pleasures look dumb. The verses you have every spiritual blessing in Christ in the heavenly places. You have everything. I don't need those shoes. I don't need that iPhone because I have Jesus. He's better than all that, right? I just wish I could believe that more. Right? The next one is worldly performance. This one is huge in America, see, because we, we judge ourselves by what we can do. We judge ourselves by our, our morality. If I could only have my quiet time, if I could only read my Bible, if I could only give to the poor and preach the gospel more and not get mad at my roommate, then God would love me. As if that's where your identity is. Right? And if I can be honest, I think a huge reason why our culture gets caught up in that one is because of our lack of fathers. I know it's true in my life. I know it's definitely true in my life. I perform because I didn't have a dad that told me I was good enough. Right? And I know I'm not the only one. And see, that, that works itself out with approval to others. We perform because we want someone else to tell us we're good. We want someone, to, someone else to tell us we're awesome. We just want to be accepted by realizing we're already accepted in Jesus. And see, if I can be real personal, God kind of convicted me massively on this issue this summer. Um, I came out with a video. That was a poem a couple months ago. Um, and I guess I kind of got lucky because it started getting a lot of views. It did. A couple hundred thousand views. And people started messaging me. People started phone requesting me. People started asking me to speak. People started giving me money to speak. I'm like a poor college, so I'll take that. I'll take that. Right? But then what did I do? I loved it. I mean, can I be honest? I loved it. And I got so caught up in it that it's so subtle, you don't realize it until it's leading to no joy, no intimacy, that I was kind of my identity in how many views I could get on YouTube. My identity was in how many friend requests I could get from people that said how awesome my poem was. I put more worth and more joy in what people said of me than what Jesus has already said of me. And that one doesn't change. The people want changes all the time. They go, oh, Hosanna to the highest to Jesus. A week later, they killed him. No thanks. I don't want to put my hope there. Right? And even, even speaking now, I have that. Right? I mean, in my spirit, when I speak, people will come up to me and, and say, oh, good job. And I'll say, in my spirit, you know, praise God. Amen. I'm glad I'm encouraged. You know, but all glory to Him. But in my flesh, I want to hear that I'm awesome. I want to hear that I'm good enough. I want to hear that I have what it takes because my dad never told me and I'm not trusting the Father when He tells me in Jesus. Right? That's just the truth. And that's the hard part about identity, is we never get down to the nitty gritty parts, we never change. But the awesome part about Jesus, again, is that verse, I don't have to earn anything, it's all given to me. When you're a prince, when you're a child of the king, you don't earn anything, you inherit everything. Think about that. When you're a prince, the kingdom is given to you. It's just given to you, nothing to do with you. It has to do with the fact that you're just in the family, and you get real lucky, because the king's rich, and has rule and reign over everything. And you get that as a gift. And so it is with Jesus. You trust in the cross that takes away your sin. And he says, man, you get it all. You get every spiritual blessing. You are pure and blameless because of Jesus. Not because of what you do. Because of what he's done. The last one is <clears throat> that we define ourselves by our past. There's another big one for me. We define ourselves by how we've messed up. Right? And I know there's people in here like that. I know there's people, including me, who define themselves by where they've messed up. There's a girl in here that's probably defined herself by the abortion she had. She's probably defined by the boyfriend she keeps sleeping with if she doesn't want to. We're defined by well, where we mess up, where we're guilty, where we have shame. We say, that's my identity. That's what I'm worth. I'm worth nothing. No one wants me. And we constantly perpetuate that thought in our head all the time. 
all the time. I mean, isn't that what Adam and Eve did? Think about it. They fell in the first two. They fell in the regards to pleasures. They saw the fruit as desirable to eat. And they did. And it didn't work. And then they tried to make themselves like God, including that, and that they could be away from them. They could perform. It didn't work. And when those two failed, you start to define yourself by your, your failure. What did they do? They went into, out of the garden and hid themselves, and they were naked and ashamed. They covered themselves with fig leaves because they didn't want to approach God anymore. I mean, we need different. They cover themselves with fig leaves. We cover ourselves with Nike shoes and Louis Vuitton. Right? I know I do. But see, here's the thing. When you are a child of the king, he loves you. And I learned this the hard way again. There was one time again that the stand stands out. When I became a Christian about six months in, I still had desires that I didn't want to let anyone know because I thought you couldn't be a Christian and mess up or fail. So I didn't want to tell anyone, right? But then things started to happen in my life. I started to get angry. And there was one time where I just was fed up. I just ran to what I always ran to before as a Christian. I was lost and girls. So what did I do? I called up a girl. She came over. I slept with her. Then she left. I was a Christian. And I immediately, upon her leaving, felt the most shame and guilt and condemnation I've ever felt in my entire life. So much so that I actually got physically sick. I still remember, I was throwing up because I just couldn't believe this me. I'm dirty, I'm filthy. And it was in that moment, God just said, I love you. I really love you. And I said, me? You can't love me. I'm addicted to pornography, Jesus. I like to party. I like to wear clothes and put my identity in those things over you. And he said, I love you. I saw that before you did. I knew you were going to do it before you did. And it was still my joy to go to the cross to get you. You are not defined by that. Your sin has been cast to the depth of the sea and it's never coming back. I've absorbed that. I have taken that. And I just broke it. I said, I will chase you and follow you for the rest of my life if that is how awesome you are. And I haven't been the same since. Do I still fail? You better believe it. But I know I can run and approach him. Because a lot of us, we would rather be employed by God than adopted by God. I mean, isn't that what happened to the prodigal son? The prodigal son comes back and says, Father, make me one of your hired servants. See, because it's more natural for us to be in that position because we know we can earn it and we know we can lose it. It's just how society works. He says, make me one of your hired servants. The father says, no. You are my son. You're getting a pure robe and you're throwing the party because I love you. That's permanent. Sonship is permanent. If you're an employee and you mess up and you define yourself by that, God fires you. But if you're a son, he loves you. I mean, think about that. An employee gets fired, but when a son messes up or a daughter messes up, the, the parent becomes more intimately involved in that kid. And so it is with Christ. He lets us run to him, not from him. And there's an example that I always use when I talk because I think it's so such a beautiful picture of the gospel and of this, that we are a child of the king. And which means when we mess up, when we mess up in all three of these areas, which I do daily, I can run to him because my standing is Jesus's, Jesus in the heavens in front of the Father, not me. Jesus represents me, I don't represent me. And he's perfect, his work is done, which means my representation is done. Right? I kind of a bug right here. <laughs> but, um, but the example I always use is like, it's like seeing a baby learn how to walk. Right? A baby, what do they do when they learn how to walk? They get up on a table and they get their hands and they kind of wobble, 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 right? And what happens? They let go and they have enough courage to let go. And babies have huge heads, by the way. And so what happens is usually they take one step and then their head is above their foot and momentum takes over, which means they either have to keep stepping or else they're just going to fall and crash their face into the carpet. Right? But what happens? They go step, 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 fall. And then what do the parents do? The parents freak out. He's walking. They get on the phone, they take pictures, they call grandma. He's walking. Like, it took three steps and fell. Right? I mean, what would it look like if a parent goes, idiot? <laughs> And the blame's like, that one's on you, honey. <laughs> Those are in your genes. We're walkers in our family. We're out of the room now. <laughs> no, but what a great picture that is of God in the heavens if you have trusted Jesus to take away your sin because it's free. Looking down and saying, he's walking. When my child messes up, he's walking. I mean, how ridiculous would it look if the child falls and then runs out the door and doesn't come back for me until he's good enough. First of all, he can't do that because he doesn't know how to walk. <laughs> And he says, he's walking, right? We are a child of the king if you have trusted in Jesus. And you have permanent 
blessing if that is the case. And because Jesus identified with us in our sin, we get to identify with Him in His baptism, where He is raised to new life, and the Father looks down and says, My Son, in whom I am well pleased. And He says that to us every day if you've trusted Him. The minute you step a foot out of the bed, He looks down and says, My Son, my daughter, in whom I am well pleased. And that has nothing to do with you. Let's pray. Jesus, I just thank you for these young men and women. I pray that your grace just wrecks some right now, including me. I pray that we just get into a deeper knowledge of what it means to trust the gospel, what it means to be okay with being broken and weak and messed up, because we have room to struggle because we don't represent ourselves. If we did, if we were your employee, then we couldn't show face. But we're a child. We can run to you in the middle of night and say, I'm lonely, I need help, Dad. Because you have an intimate relationship with us. So I pray that we just continue to put our identity in you. And when we fail to do that, we continue to remember that you are gracious and you are awesome and you are merciful. And then you pray.